The position of concern with the Jacksonville Jaguars is edge, and it's some guys at that position that have a chance to prove their point in game two of the preseason. I'll tell you who in just a second. You are Locked On Jaguars, your daily Jacksonville Jaguars podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. What up, good people? Thank you for joining me here on the Locked On Jaguars podcast. I am your host of said podcast, Tony Wiggins. We're at your team every day, and we thank you for making us your first listen. Quickly reminding you that we are also free to subscribe to on our YouTube page that is Locked On Jaguars. Make sure you hit that like button, hit the bell so you get notifications anytime we drop an episode, which is every day. And if you listen to podcasts, audio podcasts, wherever you do that at, make sure that you tap in to see if you did not or did miss an episode and you can get caught up. Today's show is brought to you by LinkedIn Jobs. Helps you find the qualified candidates you want to talk to faster. Post your job for free at linkedin.com slash locked on NFL. That's linkedin.com slash locked on NFL to post your job for free. Terms and conditions apply. Also, hello, good morning, good afternoon to my everydayers. I'm glad you guys joined me. If you want to be an everyday, all you got to do to get that hello. And a lot of people see me in public and they say, what's up, man? I'm an everyday. And it feels good to know that. And, uh, you know, if you want to be an everyday, all you got to do is just tune in every day. Leave a comment or hit me up on social media and shop talking wig on Twitter. And I'll definitely uh, shout you out if I can. Um, <clears throat> we're going to talk about Caleb Von Chase son. Overall, we're going to talk about the edge position. But then we're going to focus on Caleb Vaughn because Caleb Vaughn Chason is the main reserve, the main backup for the edge position here behind Trayvon Walker and Josh Allen. They're going to need him at some point, the same way they needed last year, the way they needed Arden Key. You are going to need a rotation of guys to play that position. Now, the young kid, Yasir Abdullah from Louisville, has looked pretty good for a guy who was picked in the sixth round, right? He doesn't necessarily fit the traits. He's not tall like everyone else. Caleb Vaughn's like 6'3 and a half. And everybody else is 6'3 six, six, and a half or bigger. Josh Allen's like 6'4, six, 6'5. Six, and Trayvon Walker's a legit 6'5. You see Abdullah 6'1, two, but 250. So while he doesn't fit the traits, he does fit the, the attitude portion of it. And he really does get after it. And he's made some noise in training camp early. And he looks like a guy that's going to contend for a spot also there's jordan smith jordan smith has a chance and an opportunity to let it be known that he's going to stick around this year even though his contract isn't guaranteed but jordan smith obviously wants to stick around after being um to being you know he was hurt last year you want to talk about tall jordan smith six seven six seven and can really really get after it and the thing that I have to tell you all about all of these guys before I tell you the outline of everything else is going to happen on the show. Most of these guys, Jordan Smith has never been a bench rider in his life. And this is sometimes I think we forget. Caleb on chase on was like a five star recruit out of Houston. I wanted him to go to Florida State and he chose LSU. And then he had his best season on a national championship LSU team in 2019. So. These guys are used to success. Rashid Abdullah had double-digit sacks last year at Louisville. These guys are used to success. Josh Allen was the seventh overall pick. Trayvon was number one overall and was considered by many to be the best player on the Georgia defense. So you wonder what it's like to get to this level and then kind of hit a little bit of a wall or, you know, find out that the level of resistance is so high that you're not going to be able to do what you always did. Not saying that what they did came easy to them, but it's real, real important. And so you have to wonder why. Is it the system? Is it alignment? Is it just them? Is it the reality? Of the re and what they're facing this weekend is the reality of the situation is it might be them. Can you imagine what it's like to realize you're not good enough? At the top, at the apex of your entire career. How many of y'all grew up wanting to play uh, football? Whether it's to be an edge rusher or basketball. You get to the pinnacle and you're right there and you've always been dominant and now you can't do it. 
we're going to examine the ways and what happens and why we think that way. Sometimes it's a legit matter of the fact that everybody can't be great. You hope to get it right as a GM, but everybody can't be great all the time. Somebody has to be. Here's a, here's a perfect example. The National Basketball Players Association, not the NBA, the NBPA, they put on a top 100 camp every year. And if you've listened to this podcast long enough, you've heard this analogy. They do a, a top 100 camp. Usually it's like the top 75 seniors, rising seniors, maybe the next 20 juniors, six or seven of the top sophomores, and maybe three or four of the of freshmen. Maybe they let them in, you know, but if they're really, really good, right? But for the most part, it's the best players in the country. Somebody's going to leave their rank number one, and somebody's going to leave their rank number 100. So you can play with words and innuendo and say, well, the 100th best guy is the worst guy there, right? But to even get invited to that camp, they think you probably have a legit shot at having a future in the NBA, or at least be a very, very good high major player. Doesn't work out. It works out sometimes that the guys at the very top, some of those guys don't pan out. They get, they usually get them right, though, because it's kind of an easier thing to do. So they usually kind of get them right. But sometimes, you know, you have a dude like John Morant, who wasn't a top 100 player, end up being one. Right? It happens. So there's just this inevitable finality, if you will, that exists when these guys get to the pros and, and they run into stuff. The thing that has saved Calavon in the eyes of people in that building is the fact that he's a hard worker. Shows up on time, shows up early, stays late, does every, and this is just from a source, does every single thing that they ask him to do and more. I'm going to tell you something. I looked the coach dead in his face and I mentioned Calavon and he smiled. He didn't laugh like y'all do because y'all thinking about that video of him on the beach working out. No, he, they, he smiled. Said, I like that kid, man. And I've had that story confirmed with other coaches on multiple occasions. So if that's the case, coaches usually like guys that are productive, right? They don't have to get along with them. We saw Antonio Brown. People weren't getting along with AB all the time when he was in Pittsburgh. They knew he was going to catch 100 balls and 13, 1,400 yards and 10, 12 touchdowns. They did not care. Everybody didn't always get along with T.O., Des Bryant. They didn't care. Produce. Well, this is a case where a kid hasn't produced, but coaches still smile about him and they still like him. He's doing everything right except producing on the field. He's not even injured. And for, I, had, I had a couple of little injuries and people wanted to make excuses for him. The fear is that you let him go, somebody else picks him up and they can tap into him and turn him into exactly what you always thought he could be. And that happens to be something that you really, really do need, right? So that's the fear in it and that's the problem. And that's where, you know, being an armchair GM like me or a podcast GM like me, it doesn't stack up to being the real thing because the real thing has to make that decision and then eventually explain why it, do, why it does and does not work. So let's go through, uh, in segment two, we're going to go through some things. We're going to find out why it hasn't worked. We're going to try to uh, come up. We ain't going to find out the answer. We don't know the answer, but we're going to come up with some ideas as to why it has not worked. And I'm probably going to end up running into a hard time making any excuse why it has not worked. Make no mistake about it. I want Kayla Von Chason to be successful. One, because he's a kid who has done all the right things. And two, if it works out, he's, it's good for the Jaguars because they get that production and that light comes on. And maybe they'd be rewarded uh, for being loyal to him. And, and then what is success? What does it, does, it, does, it, does it come with the number or does it come with being able to make big plays at big times? We'll talk about that, find out if alignment is the problem, if he's being used correctly. We'll do all of that here today on the show on Locked on Jaguars. After I let you know about today's sponsor, which is LinkedIn Talent Solutions. These days, every new potential hire can feel like a high-stakes wager for your small business. 
You want to be 100 percent certain that you have access to the best qualified candidates available. That's why you have to check out LinkedIn, jo LinkedIn jobs. LinkedIn jobs helps you find the right people for your team faster and for free. I used them when I staffed an entire barbershop. And I'm telling you, it gave me the best group of candidates and I chose the best people from that group. All you got to do is add your job and then the purple hiring hashtag frame to your LinkedIn profile to spread the word that you're hiring. Simple tools like screening questions make it easy to focus on candidates with just the right skills and experience so you can quickly prioritize who you'd like to interview. LinkedIn Jobs helps you find the qualified candidates you want to talk to faster. Post your job for free at LinkedIn.com slash LockedOnNFL, one word. That's LinkedIn.com slash LockedOnNFL to post your job for free. Terms and conditions apply. All right, man, we're running it down here. The day before the second preseason game against the Detroit Lions, the Jaguars are on the road. Uniform revealed, just in case you wanted to know, they're wearing all white. Of course, they'll be black, but they'll be wearing white pants with white jerseys with black numbers. Ken K. LeVon Chason, Nasir Abdullah, and Jordan Smith show enough to prove that the Jaguars were right by not going outside of the team and signing a free agent edge rusher. They had some people come in. They talked to Yannick Ngakwe. I don't know if he ever came here, but they did talk to him. They did get a visit from Jadavian Clowney. Doug Peterson did, uh, once he established that somebody released the, the, the report, the reported that he was here, said, yeah, he was in, you know, it was a good visit, whatever, but they haven't signed him yet. There's two things that can happen. They can look at this game and not be satisfied with their guys, but it's hard to say what satisfied really is because – they're going to be playing against backups. Detroit isn't playing any starters. And I don't think the Jaguars are going to either. They can look at this game and then make the determination whether or not they're going to go get somebody. Now, if none of these guys play well, then if it's Jadavian Clowney or whoever, whoever that is going to make a lot more money than he would have made last week because now they have more leverage. Whatever he asked for, that they are exploring whether or not it's, it's feasible to give him, they're going to have to figure out whether they do it. And I'm telling you, if you didn't act fast on me, what I'm going to make you do is I'm going to make you come see me. And then what that means is you got to pay me now because I just watched the same game you did. And now you admit that you need me. And now that you're going to double back. Yeah, it's going to cost you a little bit. It's the nature of the game. It's business. That's how this works. Alignment. Is alignment the problem? So I asked that question because Josh Allen actually had his best season when they were in a base 4-3 under Todd Wash. It's the same system that Yannick Ngakwe was in, the same system Calais Campbell played in, the same system that Dante Fowler got 11 sacks in one year. Guys had their best seasons of their career running that front. Guess who ran that front for one year and it didn't show much? Caleb Von Chason did. He ran that front because Josh Allen – was on the other side, and he was supposed to be what Josh Allen was to Yannick Ngakwe prior to that, and it did not materialize. Neither one of them played well. Josh got a little banged up that year, too, so that might have had something to do with it. But, yeah, you know, I don't know if alignment is the issue because, you know, when they go to a nickel, they go to a four-man front sometimes, and that's the same front that they would be running. Marion Hobby was really good. Mary, Mary Hobby and Todd Wash were really good at getting guys' numbers. Look at Aiden Hutchinson last year, nine and a half sacks. And just like I thought, people were sitting there comparing Aiden Hutchinson to Trayvon and wondering, my friend Rick Ballou did it on Twitter or X. He wondered, hey, man, do y'all have any regrets or whatever? Now, he just asked a question. Rick ain't trying to start trouble. He might have been trying to start trouble. That's what Rick does. But he asked questions that are poignant and, and, and pointed, and, and they deserve a direct answer. I didn't want to go there because I think it's too early to judge all of these dudes. But the question remains is if Aiden Hutchinson played in the Jaguar system, would he have gotten nine and a half sacks? And is that, a, is that something that says there's something wrong with the system? Shaquille Barrett ran the same defense and he had double digit sacks a couple of years ago. We can always say, well, he didn't have a Vita Vea. Did he? He didn't have an Indamakong Sue. We can always go there. He didn't have a Levante David backing him up that people were trying to probably run around and Devin White and all these. We can come up with all kinds of reasons for it. 
And then he also had Tom Brady on offense. They were probably ahead in a lot of games. And then the team was really – it was easy to dictate what they were going to do uh, on uh, when they were on defense. I don't know if we can blame it on alignment because – I've heard NFL players say this about running backs, and I heard them say this about edge rushers. If you can do it, you can do it. Trayvon, I'll give him more time. And by the way, I think he has been uh, playing at a lights out level in practice from what everyone is saying. The team is really, really happy with his progress, and you're going to see it show up more this year. But the thing with Chase on is usually you don't get four years to figure this out, right? But he does. He has four years to figure it out. He has a guaranteed contract. If they cut him, they still got to pay him. So it is what it is. They see something. They just want it to manifest in games. I haven't seen it much in practice, to be honest with you, over the years. And it's not that I haven't seen the really great stuff. It's like I've seen some bad stuff. And and I'll be honest with you, I ain't never coached high-level football a day in my life. But I do think I'm smart enough to know that you're not supposed to be going backwards when you're supposed to be going forward, right? If you're supposed to be sacking the quarterback, there ain't no reason nobody's supposed to have their hand in your chest and you out there fighting like a kid. And it looks like the the school resource officer is holding the dude who was in kindergarten. And I'm, I'm not saying that for people to pick at the kid because I, I – I try not to be make it personal, but the interaction that you have people, and I haven't talked to him much. I spoke to him. Because I want to kind of stay out of his way a little bit. You know, he's an intense dude. He's always like when he's coming to the field, he's always looked like he's thinking. He's working hard. He's about business. And maybe he really has to dig down deep inside and find it. I, you know, I don't know what the answers are, but I do know this. If they don't look good tomorrow against backup players, and I'm talking about all of them, Yassir, who get a little bit of uh, leeway, Jordan, there won't be much rope because right now it looks like he's number five, Jordan Smith. They really, really, really do, man, have to figure out if this is good enough. If what they have right now in the tank is good enough for this team to achieve the goals that they want to achieve this year. And I'm telling you, folks are making this out to be, and it's not even folks that's doing this. It's a natural thing to say, now, look, man, y'all really need this to happen. And if this is not going to happen, don't let that be the thing. The fact that you can't rush the passer, don't let that be the thing that causes this team to not go further. Because as good as Trent Baalke has been in the last year and a half and as much grace that he's earned back from the fans, that cannot be the one thing that you're stubborn about or that you've been stubborn about. And really, honestly, has it really been stubborn to use the number one pick on the guy to put him opposite a guy who was a top seven pick? Folks will just think that he got it wrong if it doesn't change. Or if those guys need a blow and then you don't have any depth behind them, you have nobody else to be able to come in and, and affect the quarterback. There's this thought, though, that Guys being more disciplined and understanding what they're supposed to do will amount to more sacks. I don't know how true it is, but I'll throw it out there. If they believe that that is the case, and they might not have a guy who gets 10 sacks, they just might have a bunch of players uh, with six, and it all adds up to them getting people off the field, then nobody will care at the end of the day about individual numbers as long as they win. Case in point, before last year, I told y'all that Aiden Hutchinson was probably going to have more sacks than Caleb Vaughn, but if the Jaguars won more and if they advanced further, people would back off of that a little bit and say, well, the team was better. And that's what happened. Let's touch on that in segment three. Let's talk about others who must play well in game two in order for people to stop acting like they're going to panic and then alleviate the problem in the areas where that were perceived as problem areas. We're going to do that in just a second here in segment three. On a game day edition or a prior to game day edition of Locked on Jaguar. All right, quick recap real quick what we got going on. We're going to talk about Caleb on Chase on. He has a shot to... He has a shot in the game tomorrow 
to really, really, really make his way and make people understand that the Jaguars are right about believing in him as their third pass rusher and that his future is more bright than what we've seen from him so far. I asked the question about alignment. Do you see more three or four man fronts? Is, is the way that they play friendly because they drop guys in the coverage an awful lot. When you're dropping in the coverage, that means you're not rushing a passer. One of the biggest plays of last season and maybe even the history of these Jaguars was when Josh Allen was dropped back in the coverage and Rayshon Jenkins blitzed and Josh Allen picked the ball up about eight yards down the field, scooped it up and ran it in for a touchdown to win the division last year. So it's hard to argue with a coaching staff that does things like that in critical moments. It's also hard to argue with them when the Chargers didn't score a touchdown in the second half last year in the playoff game, and that enabled the Jaguars to chip, chip, chip to the point where they kicked the game, win the field goal, and won that playoff game. And yeah, they knocked um, they knocked uh, Patrick Mahomes around a little bit. Unfortunately, when he went to the bench, Chad Henney came in and looked like Patrick Mahomes and took them on a 90-some-odd yard drive to score a touchdown. It's those moments. That's when you need people to step. Chad Henney's a statue. I know he's getting rid of the ball quick, and I know Pacheco bust, busted outside and broke. Somebody allowed him to – that somebody allowed the running back to break contain. I think it might have been on Trayvon's side. But still, the situational football, those things. So the question is, what is successful sack numbers for Caleb Von Chason? Or is it not necessarily the numbers – but the impact and the plays that he makes and the time that he makes them, that's going to really make everybody go, okay, we're good to go. We talked about the fact that somebody might get double-digit sacks, somebody might not. Maybe the whole team, or not the whole team, but four or five guys get six and a half. Maybe that works. Because as good as the 49ers are at rushing the pass and affecting the quarterback, I don't think they were as high in team sacks last year. In fact, I think they were somewhere in the 30s. And that's with perhaps the best pass rusher in the NFL in Nick Bosa. So there's more than one way to skin a cat. You can do it with formation. I've heard that guys are going to be more disciplined and, and play more together than – Possibly they did last year. These are the little things that you don't necessarily understand that maybe some guys were chasing plays instead of doing what they were supposed to do. They happened to make those plays, so it made it seem like it was okay. But really, maybe it wasn't. And we talked about that earlier this week. Coaches tell you all the time, just because you did something that worked doesn't mean you did the right thing. You just did something that worked. And sometimes they call that playing above the X's and O's, and then sometimes they, they call it playing too much, and you just got lucky. Other players that have to play good today, we mentioned them. We'll say, we're going to start with Kayla Vaughn. We're going to go with Nasir Abdullah, the rookie, and then we're going to go with number 92, Jordan Smith. And if he plays a lot, I want to see Led better get off because he asked to with Fularonzo Fadukazi having an injury, another ankle or foot injury. You don't want to go into the season with another 300 pounder down because they don't have very many guys that big like that. The Jaguars aren't a team full of 320 pounders on the, on the defensive line. Yeah. Fadukazi. And of course you have Devon Hamilton, who's about 330. After that, you got some guys who are all in their 290s, the big ends, if you will. I think even Ledbetter's 299. He looks like he's 300. Mondo, Henry Mondo looks bigger than he is, but he's listed at like 285, but he just looks like a guy who's big. I think his upper body's real big and his legs aren't. But the bottom line is, man, they got to make sure. Now, I don't think you go out and add anybody because everybody that they have under contract and then the, the young guys that they picked, like Lacey, the kid out of Oklahoma State, If they like him, they like him. But if you go out and add somebody now, he's either not very good because he's not on a team or he's an older player like Sue used to be, an older player just sitting around waiting for the right situation. But a guy like that, he ain't going to come here without a guarantee. So if you go out and bring a dude in like that, he is not a camp body. Last year when the Eagles went out and got Ndamukong Sue and then they got the other kid that used to play at Minnesota, the big nose tackle, they went out and got them because they got ran all through on a Monday night game against Washington. 
They had to give both of them guaranteed money. It might have been $1.5, $2 million each, but guess what? They get Linville Joseph, that's who it was. They gave him the money. Those dudes like that that have accomplished so much and have made a lot of money and are just sitting around waiting for the opportunity, they're not going to go to no team unless you guarantee them the, the bread. So are you willing to do that, knowing that you, you're paying Fado Kazi and Hamilton all of this money? Can you go out and do that at this stage of the game? For a guy who might just give you limited snaps. If you like the guys you like, and see, this is where I say playing armchair GM doesn't work. You can't hedge your bets on the stuff like this. If you like the dudes you like, then you ride with it and you deal with the consequences. If you like them enough, but not really, but you want to upgrade, well, now you got to go explain to the owner why you're giving a guy $2 million guaranteed money to come in here and he might not even play. Or he might not be better than the dudes that you have. So we can go on social media and play these little games like that all day but it doesn't make sense from a football standpoint and from a, 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 an actuality standpoint of what has to occur and the things that you have to think about. It's easy to type that stuff. It's hard to actually make it happen. So I do want to see the defensive linemen play. I talked about the edge rushers. Uh, Greg Jr., Devon Wilson, Breeny, Chris Braswell, somebody go win the slot. Somebody see if you can beat out Chris Herndon. I want to see if it happens. I want to see if it happens. I don't think Antonio Johnson is going to go. I, I think he's a little bit banged up, but we'll just have to see about that. Make sure you watch Locked on NFL because all of the big stories from around the NFL, and then trust me, they break every single day. You can find them there. You can find me on Locked on NFL on Wednesdays with my host, my co-host James Rapine. But every day it's a great show. You need to make sure you check it out because your team will pop up, especially if they're in the news for anything. I'd enjoy the game Saturday. If there are any major developments, you'll hear from me Saturday night or Sunday. If not, check me out Monday. I'll bring you a Monday podcast recapping everything, telling you who made a move and who didn't and what the Jaguars have to do the final week of preseason before they get that two-week break between the last preseason game and the first regular season game. Until then, you guys take care of each other, and I will keep taking care of myself. And we'll see you guys the next time we get together here on Lockdown Jaguars.